Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to the course introduction to the psychology of bilingualism and multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Varma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences, IIT Kanpur and we are talking about language acquisition in bilinguals and multilinguals. In the previous lecture, we saw that infants relied on the statistical regularities of the speech input to solve the segmentation problem. Just to recap, the segmentation problem is basically about how do infants uh, segment the continuous stream of speech into words in order to basically understand what uh, understand and isolate separate words and uh, attach those words to meanings eventually. But is uh, the statistical regularity the only cue to solving the segmentation problem? Uh, we have considered the statistical uh, you know regularities and patterns in in much more detail in the previous lecture but is it the only solution uh, in today's lecture we are trying to uh, consider an alternative uh, option as well which is prosodic bootstrapping what is prosodic bootstrapping? Uh, this is an alternative suggested by some researchers that in addition to the statistical learning device as shown by Safran and colleagues, infants also rely on the prosodic characteristics of speech, for example, the rhythm of speech in order to distinguish, in order to segment the continuous uh, stream of speech into words. Now note that three that you know you can typically uh, uh, distinguish between different languages, uh, distinguish different languages into basically three kinds of categories based on rhythm. For example, there are stress based languages like German, English and Dutch. There are syllable based languages like French, Spanish and Italian and also there are Mora based languages such as Japanese. Now these three classes basically emerge based on the kind of rhythm uh, scheme that is used in these languages. Now, infants have, uh, have been shown to, uh, you know, utilize and understand the rhythmic scheme of a given language and use that for segmenting the speech stream into words. Let us see some examples. Many studies have shown that, say for example, adults can exploit the specific rhythmical pattern of their native language to segment the stream of speech using a segmentation procedure which is uh, basically attuned to or based on the metrical unit that is typical for this language. For example, Meller and colleagues demonstrated that since syllables are very clear and unambiguously defined in French uh, and as French uses a syllable timed uh, stress, uh, syllable timed pattern, French adult speakers are actually very adept at uh, you know using syllables uh, as a tool to mark the word boundaries in a continuous stream of speech. In contrast, native adult speakers of Dutch and English actually uh, are found to utilize stress patterns to segment their speech stream into words. For example, uh, most of the words in English uh, you know carry the stress on the first syllable for example, baby, bottle uh, and so many other words uh, which carry the stress on the first syllable. These words are referred to as having trochaic stress pattern. Similarly, uh, only a few words have the, what is called the iambic stress pattern basically having uh, stress on the second syllable which are words like uh, uh, guitar, debate and so on. So, the idea is that infants and adults can actually use if they find uh, words having uh, uh, you know stress patterns on the first syllable as a cue to determining word boundaries. Again, this is something that probably does not always work but can be a very good clue in addition to the statistical regularities of speech for infants or and adults to basically utilize and segment the continuous stream of speech into words. Now, given that rhythm can actually be useful in segmenting the speech stream into specific languages, how would this play out in, in the case of bilinguals? How would bilinguals segment the speech stream with the help of prosodic characteristics? For instance, one may ask that whether bilinguals behave like two monolinguals, basically let's say if, I, if my first language is English and my second language is French, do I use uh, stress based uh, pattern to distinguish uh, to segment English and syllable based pattern to segment French or do I use a combination or a, you know amalgamation of both these strategies which I apply to both English and French whenever I am listening or trying to segment them. 
So this is something that uh, you know a lot of researchers have asked and a bunch of experiments have been carried out. I have picked up one similar experiment to sort of talk about this in a bit more detail. So Cutler and colleagues actually took a group of highly proficient French English bilinguals and tested them in both English and French languages to basically check for what kind of uh, segmentation strategy they are utilizing to segment materials from English and French. The result collapse across, across all participants presented a rather ambiguous pattern where uh, you know in neither condition the bilinguals replicated the behavior of the corresponding monolingual group. So for example, these were French English bilinguals, their pattern of results neither represented the French monolinguals nor they uh, resembled the English monolinguals. So initially the uh, pattern of results were rather mixed and uh, uh, authors were obviously uh, you know at a loss as to exp how to explain these uh, results. So what they do is that they sort of try to zoom in and they subdivided the participants into two groups based on the preference of language and then analyze the data on these two groups separately. What did they uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, how would they divide uh, the uh, participants into language groups by preference? They actually posed the question that, okay, in case of, uh, an, uh, you know, a scenario where you are given uh, a choice as to which of the two languages that you know you want to retain, uh, and uh, you know, so the, and the individuals who are basically supposed to answer either in English or French. So they actually gave one answer, uh, depending upon you know which language they preferred speaking in, or which language is prob probably their native language. In the sense, uh, and once they sort of gave these answers, uh, Cutler and colleagues could divide the participants into two groups: uh, the French dominant group and the English dominant group. Once the data was analyzed separately for these two groups, an interesting pattern of results emerged. Now, uh, the results were, depending upon which language is dominant or preferred, bilingu bilinguals may either, uh, you know, behave like two monolinguals within one person or apply the same segmentation strategy to both their languages. To be more specific, French dominant participants performed similar to French monolinguals when they were segmenting French materials uh, using a syllable based segmentation scheme and they performed like English monolinguals when they were segmenting English materials using a stress based segmentation scheme. Interestingly, the pattern was slightly different in English dominant participants who used the stress based segmentation scheme to uh, uh, segment materials both in English and in French. This sort of is confusing because if the English dominant participants also followed a similar strategy using a stress base for English and syllable base for French, you would say that okay, bilinguals actually uh, you know perform segmentation based on the kind of language that they are segmenting. But this sort of is still a mixed result and the authors were trying to you know account for this by proposing that syllabic segmentation is something of uh, you know is something similar to a uh, you know a special or a marked routine that language users would only develop if necessitated by their native language or their preferred language. So basically what they were trying to say is that syllable based segmentation scheme is not the default one, it only develops in individuals when for example their native language necessitates, necessitates it. So they proposed that such a routine would be developed and used only if the individual is dominant or native to you know syllable based segmentation language like French and they would in addition, if they are acquiring a second language, in addition they would be able to use another uh, strategy, for example the French uh, bilinguals did, another uh, strategy stress based segmentation for segmenting materials from a different language which was English. So here what we can see is that the segmentation strategy that individuals are uh, using to segment their language does sort of rely a little bit on the rhythm. Uh, or on the rhythmic scheme of the given language, but it is not sort of uniform across the different types of bilinguals. It basically depends on various factors such as the preferred or the dominant language that is used by a given group of bilinguals. Now this was mainly adult studies. Let us move on and look at infant studies. How does this, how does this play out in infants? Uh, a number of infant studies have actually looked at and they have tried to investigate the age at which the sensitivity to specific rhythmic schemes actually develops for these specific languages. For instance, some research has suggested for uh, some research has suggested that sensitivity to the language rhythm is actually innate. 
and they base their uh, assumption on the fact that findings from uh, that newborns were actually found to be able to distinguish between rhythmically different languages, but not between rhythmically sing, uh, similar language. For example, if you test infants, they would be uh, able to distinguish between uh, let us say English and French, but they would not be able to distinguish between English and Dutch which are uh, from the same rhythmic class. Interestingly, some researchers have also shown that this ability to distinguish between rhythmic classes is not specific to humans only and is also found with in other mammals and other species such as the tamarind monkeys and rats. It could give us a clue that this ability of uh, perceiving rhythm in a language is something which is again uh, deriving from the general property of the auditory system and therefore is something that is shared with other species as well. So, it is not something that is language specific or developed specifically to deal with language, but it is probably a more generic property of the auditory system that is sort of in some sense utilized or comes handy when we are talking about languages and when we are talking about uh, segmenting languages based on rhythm. Now, moving forward from birth, uh, infants knowledge of their native language increases and it sort of starts influencing their ability to discriminate between their native language and other languages as well. Let us look at it. Mellard and colleagues found that two month old English speaking infants could actually discriminate between English and Italian. They remember English is stress, English uses stress based segmentation whereas Italian uses syllable based uh, segmentation. But they could not distinguish between French and Russian which belong to the similar uh, you know uh, rhythmic class. Similarly, Christoph and Morton demonstrated that two month old English speaking English babies basically were able to discriminate, uh, discriminate between English and Japanese again English and Japanese from two different rhythmic classes, but not between French and Japanese. Even though in both cases the languages belong to both rhythmic classes. So, in that sense this ability of being able to distinguish languages based on rhythmic classes is also not a uh, foolproof ability. It is not because uh, both these language pairs belong to different rhythmic classes and if this ability were foolproof infants should have been able to distinguish between both English and Japanese as well as French and Japanese, but we see that that is not really the case. So, again uh, it is something that is a very useful uh, you know uh, uh, strategy, but it is not a foolproof strategy that allows infants to distinguish between different languages just based on the rhythmic differences. A more interesting pattern of results was uh, later presented by Christoph and colleagues when they tested this uh, two groups of uh, two month old infants. Uh, they divided them into two subgroups and found very interestingly that one, while one group failed to discriminate between native English and foreign Dutch, probably treating this, them in the same way because they belong to the same rhythmic class, but and another group succeeded in discriminating between foreign Dutch and foreign Japanese. So, what is happening here is that these infants are you know obviously considering English and Dutch as their native language together because they are very very similar to each other not only in the stress based uh, rhythm that they use, but also in other prosodic characteristics. But uh, foreign Dutch and foreign uh, Japanese uh, basically are also distinguishable because they belong to different rhythmic classes. Now, an interesting study in this regard was conducted using a visual orientation procedure by Bosch and Sebastian Gauls in 1997, where they uh, looked at uh, you know comparing the ability of monolingual and bilingual infants uh, for discriminating between a pair of rhythmically similar languages. Uh, one with one of them would be native and the other would be foreign. Remember, these languages belong to the same rhythmic class, but one is a native language, the other is a foreign language. So, what did they do? They uh, across two experiments, they tested for three languages, Catalan, Spanish and Italian, all of which are uh, basically belong to the same class uh, using uh, uh, you know syllable based segmentation. So, in the first experiment, they found that four month old infants growing up in Spanish or Catalan homes uh, basically uh, and, you, and they presented them with Catalan or Spanish sentences and the results showed that infants coming from Catalan homes oriented faster to Catalan sentences uh, and slower to Spanish sentences and infants coming from Spanish home oriented faster to uh, Spanish sentences and slightly slower to Catalan sentences. This basically tells us that these infants 
are now able to distinguish between native language and a foreign language even though they are belonging to the same rhythmic class. So, you can see while at birth they were only being able to make broader distinction between uh, you know languages belonging to different rhythmic classes around four months of age they are being able to distinguish between a native language uh, and a foreign language despite the fact that they belong to two different rhythmic classes. Now, in the second experiment, these four month old infants from Catalan Spanish bilingual homes were presented with either Catalan sentences or Spanish sentences and on one hand and on the other hand they were contrasted with Italian sentences. Here the results showed a very interesting uh, pattern and that showed a difference in orientation time for familiar Catalan or Spanish on one hand and Italian on the other hand. So, see we are putting Catalan and Spanish in one basket and Italian in one basket and we are sort of trying to compare them and what is basically happening is that uh, infants are taking slightly longer time uh, for the familiar language. So, basically what is happening is uh, to decide between Itali uh, Catalan and Spanish they are taking slightly longer time uh, and taking a slightly lesser time uh, you know uh, for orienting to uh, Italian. Now, why would this happen? Uh, basically, what the researchers sort of uh, argue and they say is that what might be happening here is that when these infants are hearing the familiar language materials, either from Catalan or Spanish because these are bilingual infants and have been exposed to both these languages, they might spend some initial time first trying to determine which of their native languages is being spoken in. So, for example, they might spend the first few milliseconds or first few seconds to determine uh, whether uh, English is being spoken or Catalan is being spoken and then they are sort of uh, making uh, you know the time to orient to either of the two and as compared to Italian uh, if you are just comparing ca Catalan to Italian or Spanish to Italian the, uh, the discrimination would be a little bit faster. So, given the fact that the two language condition led to different orienting times can probably indicate that these four month old biling bilingual to be infants could also discriminate between two languages of the same uh, rhythmic class uh, irrespective uh, of same rhythmic class because one is uh, uh, native in this case and the other is foreign. To summarize, uh, we can say that infants at birth seem to be able to discriminate between rhythmically different languages. At around two months, they can discriminate between their native language on the one hand and a foreign language on the other hand even if the foreign language belongs to the same rhythmic class. Around four months of age, however, infants from both monolingual and bilingual homes can get this ability to discriminate between their native language and a rhythmically similar language. So, what is happening is that you can see chronologically from birth, even though the capability of uh, discriminating uh, rhythm may be innate, they are gradually sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, advancing this ability a bit more and they are being able to utilize this ability of discriminating between rhythmic classes to discriminate between their languages. Remember, all of this is feeding into their language perception system allowing them to uh, you know uh, attend to whatever language input uh, they are getting in more discrete ways in more sophisticated ways and this is basically what they are using to build on uh, you know this capability of uh, you know uh, isolating words from this uh, you know uh, continuous stream of speech and then the next task that sort of remains then is to st start attaching meanings to these words. So, this is something which tells us if you look at these results with uh, you know at one month uh, of age, two months of age and four months of age, it is something that sort of tells us that around this time around four months of age infants have now acquired the phonetic uh, knowledge that is specific to their native language and they have started using it to uh, you know discriminate their native language with other languages. Remember, if you look at Kul's timeline or chronology of uh, language acquisition, uh, especially in case of perception, it is around this time that they are starting to also notice, uh, you know, uh, language specific combinations of sounds and so on. And you can very easily, uh, if you make this connection, you can very easily make this connection between this ability also being a very important part of making those uh, decisions going further when they have to sort of uh, isolate words from speech. Uh, prefer their native language over other languages and so on.
So uh, that's all that I wanted to sort of say uh, with respect to you know prosodic bootstrapping. Uh, we have seen so far in the two lectures about statistical bootstrapping and prosodic bootstrapping as one of the major ways to solve the segmentation problem. Uh, what remains now is that we sort of once infants have started being able to segment this continuous stream of speech into words, we will look at in the next lecture as to how they start attaching meanings to the learned words. Thank you. Thank you.